here to worship, to seek the truth, to grow in love, to join in service, to celebrate life's beauty and find healing for its pain, to honour our kinship with each other and with the earth, to create a more compassionate world beginning with ourselves. To wonder at the mystery that gave us birth. To find courage for the journey's end. And to listen for the wisdom that guides us. That guides us in the quietness of this moment. Come, let us worship together. And let's begin by singing our first Hymn for this morning, hymn number 174, a church is a living fellowship, more than a holy shrine, where people can share their hopes and fears, less of the yours and mine, hymn number 174.
O God, whom we know as love, we gather here this morning as seekers and finders, creators and destroyers, givers and receivers of love. From the day of our birth, we have asked for love. And yet, as we grow and change in time, we realise how little we really know about how love is given and how to grow within its nurture. Help us to recognise the love that surrounds us and in which we have our being. Help us to understand how we can be perfect channels of that love. Help us to see ourselves as the loving people we are and can be. In silence now, we bring to our mind's eye the people who have loved us and continue to love us. People who are not here with us today, but whose love we carry with us. People who are there every day and whose love we sometimes take for granted. People who might be within our circle of love, could we but extend it a little further, could we but open our circle of love further, in silence now, let us hold those people in our hearts. In returning from silence, we ask that our hearts may be open to all whose names and whose faces have crossed our minds. We ask that old wounds may be healed, that constant joys may be celebrated, and that the love we share with the people in our lives, may that be our abiding teacher. Amen. Now it's a story I first heard when I was a very, very young lad actually, probably maybe eight, nine years old. It's a story I heard from primary school. It's the story of stone soup. Does anybody know that tale? A few of you do. Alan doesn't. Alan's shaking his head firmly. Alan does not know this story. Well, you may know it after I've finished telling it to you, Alan. The story of stone soup. One day in a land far, far away, in a remote village, a stranger knocked at a woman's door. And of course she opened the door to the stranger and the stranger said to her, Madam, I've been travelling thousands and thousands of miles. I'm hungry. Do you have any food to spare? And the lady looked a little forlorn and said to the man, I'm sorry. I've got nothing in the house. Well, don't worry. I've got a magic stone. And he unfurled from his bag a magic stone. It doesn't look particularly magic, does it? It just looks like an ordinary stone. It could be any stone from anywhere. But the man said, he said, all I need is a big pot of boiling water. And I can make it. The most tasty, wonderful, beautiful soup in the whole of human history. And so the lady did, was intrigued, did as the man asked. And she got out a pot, filled it with water, put it over the fire, began to boil the pot. And they sat down together around the warm, warming around the fire. After a while, the woman said she needed to nip out and go speak to her neighbour. So she travelled next door, went to her neighbour and told her neighbour of this strange visitor 
this magic stone and this special soup that he was going to prepare. And the neighbour went to another neighbour and told their neighbour about this soup that the man was going to prepare. And she went to another neighbour. And soon the whole village came to the lady's house and stood around the fire watching this soup come to boil. After a while, he took out his stone and he put the stone in the pot. And then he took out a spoon. You need to use your imagination there. I forgot to bring a spoon. But you've all got good imaginations. Even Alan, you've got a good imagination, haven't you? Took out his spoon, took a taste of the soup. Ah, oh, that is delicious. But I think we could improve it with just a few potatoes. So one of the neighbours said, well, I've got some potatoes at home. So she dashed off home, got out some potatoes, chopped them up, peeled them, of course she peeled them. And brought the potatoes to the house, passed them to the man, and he dropped them in the soup, one by one. They all sat round the fire, watching the pot boil. Again, he took out his spoon again. Use your imagination, I forgot my spoon. He took a taste of the soup once again. Oh, magnificent. Oh, that's beautiful. The best soup I've ever tasted. But... I think we could improve it. I think we could turn this soup into stew if we just added some meat. Well, another neighbour said, well, I, I've been preparing some meat at home for the family meal. I'll go and collect that. So off she trotted, got the meat, brought it to the man. He placed the, the meat in the pot. The pot continued to boil. They all stood around. In anticipation, they all looked a bit like you all look, actually. You're all waiting to see what happened to the story. Yeah. They looked, they looked, they began to salivate even a bit. I don't think you're that hungry, are you? But it's quite. But the man again took out his real spoon, took another taste. Oh, wonderful. This is, this is gorgeous, gorgeous. The best soup I've ever tasted. But I think we could improve it. I think a few vegetables might improve this soup somewhat. Well, the lady, the lady went, dashed off home, brought some chopped up diced carrots and some onions, gave them to the man. You know what he did next? What did he do? He put them in the soup. Of course he did, obviously, didn't he? Well, he's not going to eat them, is he? Raw. Put them in the soup. The soup began to boil. Took out his spoon after a little while. Had another taste. Oh! But I think it needs a little seasoning. Just, just a tad, just a touch, just a touch of seasoning. So the lady offered him some seasoning. He put the seasoning in the soup. Boiled a bit longer. Got out his spoon to it. Now it's ready. Bring your bowls, bring your spoons. And we will share in this sumptuous meal. The finest meal you've ever tasted. So they all ran off their bowls, got their spoons. Some brought some bread, some brought some cheese, brought fruit, veg, and other, and other things to add to the glorious meal. And they all sat, and he bought, ladled out the soup, and they all enjoyed the finest meal that that village had ever enjoyed in all its history. In fact, this was the first time that the people of that village had ever eat, sat down and eaten together. And as they sat down and enjoyed their wonderful meal, the man quietly slipped away. But he left his magic stone behind. And you know what? Whenever that little village wanted to enjoy a superb meal, all they had to do was get out the magic stone and enjoy the finest meal the village ever enjoyed together. So that is the story of stone soup. <coughs> Did you enjoy that, Alid? You know the story now, yes, good, good. I know that Phil did. Could we now receive this morning's collection, but please, no stones, please. <laughs> 
Martin will get very upset. <laughs> The second hymn I've chosen for this morning is one of my favourites, actually. The opening line, God speaks to us in burdened song, in winds that drift the clouds along, above the tin of toil and wrong, melody of love. Really speaks to my own personal spirituality. And anybody who, who knows me, my little personal spiritual barometer is, when I walk out of my front door, if I notice the birds singing, I know I'm in a good place. If I, don't, if I don't notice them, there's something not quite right in me. You may have your own little barometers, but that's my little one. Just those birds singing. God speaks to me in bird and song, definitely. So let's join together in singing our second hymn for this morning. Hymn number 235, In Melody of Love. Hymn number 235. say it's a super service because my reading starts in the soup by Robert Walsh. My dictionary says that the word minister is etymologically related to the word ministroni. I'm not making this up. They're both derived from the Latin root that means to serve. The image of ministry as ministroni is particularly apt for the ministry church people do all together that make us a ministering congregation. Each bean, each vegetable, each little piece of macaroni or pinch of spice 
gives not only its substance to the soup, but also its spirit, its texture, its colour, its flavour, its aroma. Each person offers a unique set of gifts. And if we do our job organising well, each gift will be creatively matched with a need so that the whole business becomes a warm, nourishing, life-giving religious community. All who serve the church and the principles and values we hold dear are ministers. If you are doing part of that work, you are doing ministry, no matter how unlikely it may seem. You are in the soup, the ministrone of ministry. <laughs> I'd like to now invite Rosemary forward, who's going to share this morning's final reading with us. The second reading is written by a native Indian chief, American John Fire, Lane Deer who lived from 1903 to 1976. He was born on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, which is the home to the seven tribes of the Lakota Nation. This was following the Wars of the Plains in 1870, during which millions of acres of the Indians' land was confiscated by the United States in defeat of the Indian tribes. It is home to the Sioux, who believe, basically, Earth is biological mother, Buffalo is the most revered animal, everything in life is symbolic, part of creation, sacred, and there is nothing neutral about being human. So, this reading is something to think about from a full-blooded Sioux a seeker of visions. <coughs> what do you see here, my friend? <coughs> Just an ordinary old cooking pot, black with soot and full of dents. It is standing on top of that old wood stove, and the water bubbles and moves as the uh, moves the lid as the white steam rises to the ceiling. Inside the pot is boiling water, chunks of meat with bone and fat, plenty of potatoes. It doesn't seem to have a message, that old pot, and I guess you don't give it a thought, except the soup smells good and reminds you that you are hungry. But I'm an Indian. I think about ordinary, common things like this pot. The bubbling water comes from the rain cloud. It represents the sky. The fire comes from the sun, which warms us all. Men, animals, trees. The meat stands for the four-legged creatures, our animal brothers, who gave of themselves so that we should live. The steam is living breath. It was water, now it goes up to the sky and becomes a cloud again. These things are sacred. Looking at that pot full of good soup, I am thinking now and how, in this simple manner, Wakantanka takes care of me. We Sioux spend a lot of time thinking about everyday things in which our minds and thoughts are mixed up with the spiritual. We see in the world around us many symbols that teach us the meaning of life. You could notice if you wanted to, but you are usually too busy. We Indians live in a world of symbols and images 
where the spiritual and the commonplace are one. To us, they are part of nature, part of ourselves, the earth, the sun, the wind and the rain, stones, trees, animals, even little insects like ants and grasshoppers. We try to understand them not with the head, but with the heart. And we need no more than a hint to give us the meaning. Amen. Thank you, Rosemary. So we've already shared quite a bit of food for thought, food for feeling this morning. And um, I'd like us now just to share together a quiet time, really. Time for personal prayer, quiet reflection, meditation. A personal time, but a time in communion, in community with one another. Now, this is a fellowship of love. A church is a living fellowship of love. So let's join together in silence. Let's quieten our minds. Let's still our bodies. Connect to our breathing. Let's be still. And let's be silent. Amen. Let's now join together in singing our third hymn for this morning. A hymn that is a particular favourite, I know, of several members of the congregation here. And it speaks much about how people can see the same thing, but experience it so differently. So let's join together in singing our third hymn, hymn number 233, Others Call It God. Hymn number 233. <coughs>
in me, I always like to listen to the final verse of the third hymn as I wander up here. Thank you. I feel well fed now. Over the winter, I've rediscovered an old love. I don't get excited, it's not one of those kind of loves. No. I've rediscovered a love for soup. Has anybody else been enjoying soup this winter? Well, my, well, what's your favourite? No favourites? No one got a favourite? Yours is minestrone now, is it? Oh, lovely. Butternut squash, who was that? You're making ham and pea? Well, I'll come to your house because that's my favourite. Pea and ham soup is my favourite. And as you know, I don't come from this side of the Pennines. You know that by now. So it's obvious to some folk, but not as obvious to others. I'm getting better. You're starting to understand me, are you, Martin? Kind of. You're putting up with me, I know. And as Mike, unfortunately, isn't with us, we are in Cheshire, though, aren't we? And as Mike always said when he went to Scarborough, oh, Cheshire, yes. Mine account is Cheshire, Cheshire. I'm also a cricket fan. But where I come from, we have a, there is a great delicacy. Can you guess what that is? Well, that's the obvious one. But mushy, mushy peas. Where I come from, people love mushy peas. And in my family, on Christmas Day when we have dinner, we have mushy peas with our Christmas dinner. Does anybody else do that? Well, you're missing out. You're all, you're all into fancy stuff. We have mushy peas. And I have to say, I love it. But I love, I love mushy peas with anything, really. I have to say, proper mushy peas. And I, when I think of mushy peas, I always think of, it brings back childhood memories, really, of being a little boy. And one of the meals we would have, and our large family, there were quite a few of us, and we all liked to eat, we would have pie and peas one, one night of the week. And my mother, the night before, would soak the peas in a huge bowl. She would go to work the next day, and she would come home and lovingly prepare the meal for the family. I don't think I really appreciated the love and the effort that went in. She would do a hard day at work and then we'd come home and cook for, for us a lot. And I don't know if we ever really appreciated that. I think gratitude is something that I've only really developed later in life. I didn't see the love in that simple act of giving and serving her family and doing it purely out of love. And it's my belief in those very simple acts of love but the love that I know as God truly reveals itself, truly incarnates once again in life when a person gives from their heart to another human being and they simply receive it. It's as simple as that really for me. We can all get into complex theology and I do myself. In my belief, God comes to life in those moments. I know it, I feel it in my gut. And I've got a big gut, as you know. When I first read Robert Walsh's lovely minestrone in the soup idea, I just fell in love with it straight away. It made perfect sense to me. And as you know, I have another love that's developed more recently. A love for etymology. Struggle to say that. It's not an easy word. It's not, that really is a mouthful. And that etymology basically is the history of words. How words develop, where words come from. Words actually are often more interesting in their original meaning than what they actually mean today. And some of them change vastly different. I've talked several times with you about them. And I also think they reveal something rather interesting about human development and human characteristics. How words have changed with time often reflects how human society has changed. You can think of certain obvious words that have really changed it, but I'm not going to repeat them in a place of worship. So yes, but how, what does this, what does this tell us about the work of a clergyman such as myself and a bowl of soup? How can a bowl of soup have anything to do with the work that I do? Well, as the reading tells us, the word ministrone and the word minister means to serve simple and of course i'm not the only person that serves this community am i we all bring something to it we all bring something of our substance something of our spirit we all add to the substance and the spirit of this community and we all share in that meal i know the work that many people 
put in this community quietly unmentioned often those that sit towards the back that don't get noticed sometimes but we all bring something to this community we all share in a bounteous feast we all minister in some way to one another but it's not just for us we bring different things we believe different things it's part of our tradition but we join together we commune together that's what a church is a living fellowship that's what it means a living breathing feeding fellowship but it's not just for us it's for the world outside of our window the world that we don't always pay that much attention to that meal that we create is not just for us to share it it's for everybody who wants to it who wants to join us at our table or maybe we need to go to their table and feed them i suspect to some degree this is what paul paul the epistle was getting at in his letter to the corinthians how in that famous letter when he was basically telling them off because they were all falling out with each other because they all thought that their gifts were far more important than the other person's and what he was basically saying was each gift is as important each person brings a special unique gift to each community to the soup if you like that we all share in and by coming together and creating this soup we can build that beloved community that we can share with the world outside of our window. I love that stone soup story that we heard earlier. I hope you love it too now, if you, if you haven't heard it before. Again, it speaks so much about, the, about what Paul was saying, about what, about what this ministry story is saying. Okay, they're intrigued about this ordinary looking stone which a friend of mine gave me the other day. It's actually not that ordinary. There's a lovely fossil in it. I'll show you it later if you like. It was their intrigue. They, but what the, that is what inspired them to create their wonderful, bounteous meal. But it only, beca- it only came to life when they brought everything to the pot. And that's what we do, I believe, as a loving, breathing fellowship of love. This is a fellowship of love. We sail this ship every week. I know I keep telling you about it. But I love looking at our ceiling. This is a fellowship of love. The stone soup story also brings another story to my mind, which I've shared a version of with you before. This version I want you to share with you now is, is from the Jewish tradition. But I think, and the, but there are versions of it in every single culture. The version I've shared with you before was from Japan, and that's a story called Chopsticks. You may remember it, I don't know. Anyway, this is the Jewish version of the story. One day a rabbi was speaking to the Lord, and he asked him to show him the difference between heaven and hell. Do you know the difference? Well, this rabbi didn't either. He puzzled over it, he agonized over it for weeks and months and years. So God said, well, I'll show you the difference. And he took him to a room. And in the room were many thin, pale-faced, miserable-looking people all sat around a table. In the middle of the table was a huge bowl of steaming stew. They all had very long spoons in their hands. This were attached to their hands. They could reach the bowl. They could scoop out the food. But they couldn't get the food in their mouths. So they all went hungry. They were emaciated. They could not feed the rabbi felt very sorry for them. He felt with his heart with compassion. And God said, now I'm going to show you heaven. And they just went next door. Apparently it's not very far away. Walked into a, a very similar looking room. But this room, again, a table in the middle of the room, a bowl in the middle of the table, and people sat all around the table, the spoons attached to their hands. But these people all looked happy and jolly and were very well fed indeed. The rabbi turned to God the Lord and said, How is this possible? How how have these how are these people eat? And he simply smilingly turned to the rabbi and said, Well it's simple really. But it requires a certain skill. These people have learned to feed each other. 
They could reach the bar. They could put the food on the spoon. And they could put the food in their neighbor's mouths. And that's the difference between heaven and hell. Looks the same, but it's lived very differently. Ministry and ministry share the same root. They both mean to serve. Simple, isn't it, really? It is the purpose, I believe, of communities like ours to come together to serve one another, to make a bounteous meal, a wonderful feast, and to share it with our world. One of my roles each week is to feed you, feed you in worship. I hope that keeps you going through the week. But you feed me in ways that I cannot even begin to describe. In little tiny ways often. Just like those birds that say out of my window when I walk out the door. They feed me too. And I hope, I hope what I feed you each week though. Affects you in such a way that you can then begin to feed the people that you come into contact with. Through your daily interactions, through your daily lives. That you can be stones if you like simple magic stones in other people's lives strangers in the street that those concentric circles of compassion that i keep going on about can go out from us that we can affect our world in a positive way because the meal we share in is no good if only we share in it if it only feeds our bellies there's no serving in that is there it sounds like self-serving really we all thirst and we all hunger for meaning in our materially abundant lives. We cannot feed this hunger in isolation, in self-reliance. It is only fed in that relationship that occurs as we feed one another. To me, this is the purpose of communities like ours. Living, breathing, fellowships of love. The church is a living fellowship. More than a holy shrine. And in somewhere in that space, in that magic space, if you like, it occurs as we feed one another, as we eat from, we, from one another's plates and drink from one another's overflowing cup. Somewhere in that, the love that is God incarnates once again in human life. That's my belief, more than my belief, it's my experience. I know that to be true. We all hunger for purpose and for meaning as Victor Frankl pointed out we are driven by a will to find meaning and purpose but I would go further and suggest that we're also driven by a need to find companionship in our seemingly increasingly isolated and isolating cultures we need to serve one another or our souls will starve we will be emaciated we will not be fed and it truly is in giving that we receive they feed, they come and eat from our table, and we can go and eat from theirs. As I said last week, that's what I would like us to focus on during this Lenten season. What we can give to our world is simple little individual acts of love. And it can begin, you know, that chaos theory of compassion I've often talked about, can begin by just a little smile in the street to a stranger. Can just begin with that, can lift someone up. Give them some hope, even in the coldest winter. Remember the stone soup stone. The stranger brought the gift of the stone and through it, through awakening their intrigue, he inspired others to bring what gifts they had to offer to the pot. And guess what? By doing so, they all ate. They were all filled. They were all fully filled. They lived fulfilled lives. Thank you for that bit of wisdom, Chris, the other week. They were fully filled. Remember, we're all in the soup together. So let's all add our little substance and our little flavour. And let's join together in a bounteous feast. From you I receive to you. I give, together we share, and from this we live. Amen. So let's end with our final hymn for this morning. <coughs> hymn number 188, 
let love continue long and show to us the way and if that love be strong no hurt can have a say Malcolm and Fellner's family hymn number 188 of love the love for one another the love for life the love for God may we carry that love with us in all that we feel all that we think all that we say and all that we do Amen